Hello, and welcome to my talk entitled Evaluating the REPS Brief Resilience Intervention for Students in Higher Education, a multi-study mixed methods program of research. Thanks to my collaborators who are listed in the top left of the screen. Uh, this talk is for the ESRAD Online Conference 2021. So a little bit about the intervention itself before we carry on. It was developed originally five years ago to meet the need for a preventative, proactive intervention to help improve student well-being and mental health. Universities are investing considerable amounts of money in reactive interventions, such as counselling provision, but much less in preventative interventions that aim to give students the skills to ensure that they don't get too stressed and their mental health issues don't develop to a point where there becomes a clinical problem. So our aim was to develop an intervention that could be delivered in one day with regular follow-ups for a month or embedded within a module delivered over a number of weeks. And the REPS has been delivered in both of these ways thus far. It was developed based on a review of existing interventions and also an in-depth qualitative investigation of what students need and want by way of supported help in boosting their well-being and minimizing stress. And it's been delivered to over 500 students so far, all currently at the University of Greenwich. The next steps will be to extend to other universities and hopefully other countries too. So how is re resilience conceptualized for the, re for the REPS? Well, based on existing literature, resilience is conceptualized as follows. Uh, we use it to refer to a person's total capacity for maintaining psychophysical homeostasis despite external stresses and bouncing back from stressful life events. So it's a holistic construct that incorporates others and draws them together under a basic notion of positive, effective stress management that allows for uh, positive outcomes during and after uh, a stressful event in someone's life. It's a biopsychosocial phenomenon. Thus, it incorporates both physiological social and psychological aspects and requires skills at those three levels to intervene in terms of enhancing resilience at physiological, psychological and social levels. And all of those skills can be learnt, although people may come to the process of developing resilience with different base levels based on their own disposition. This is a theory that was influential on how we conceive resilience. Uh, it's a process theory developed by Richardson in 2002. I won't dwell on it here now due to the short duration of this presentation, but if you'd like to know more, there, there'll be a reference at the end. You can see that in essence, we're talking about a, a process which looks at disruption to homeostasis and resilient or recovery reintegration uh, based on the, the deployment of coping processes. Um, so it very much conceives of resilience as a process. The structure of the training program is in three parts. Now those three parts each have two workshops involved. So cognitive resilience is the first session, uh, which has two workshops, then the social resilience, and then mind-body resilience or psychophysiological resilience. And I'll talk you through each of those three sections briefly now in terms of the two workshops that we do and the, the ethos of those workshops. So firstly, in terms of cognitive resilience, we start with positive reframing. Now the idea uh, behind the positive reframing workshop is to give participants the meta-awareness that the interpretations they have of events in their life are their own, and that there are different ways of making sense of the world and making sense of themselves that are available to them as well. This self-reflective process of drawing a distinction between events and interpretations is something that many students have not engaged with at all when we do this workshop. Goal setting, so we use uh, goal maps, goal scheduling and effective planning processes to help students take control of the many tasks and goals that they have to balance during their time at university. Again, this is an essential life skill that many students have not been taught before. And it, it really is right at the heart of autonomous and self-regulating ways of functioning that are essential for positive adult development in our view. In social resilience, we have two workshops. The first is effective social support, where we cover a range of potential social supports and sources of help present at university, and then explore barriers 
present to seeking help, including feelings of embarrassment or not wanting to look weak or not wanting to burden other people's time. And we look at ways of overcoming these barriers. We also consider how to handle consumption of social media and make it a source of support rather than stress. In the workshop after that, we do assertiveness and we look at body language and communication skills that help individuals maintain a sense of agency and personal control in challenging social situations. This thus mitigates a range of sources of social stress and students report that um, for those who do engage with the exercises that it does boost their social resilience. In Mind Body Resilience, we have two parts. We have a session on breathing for relaxation, where we look at diaphragm breathing, slow rhythmic breathing, and other proven strategies for um, improving psychophysiological balance in terms of parasympathetic functioning, endocrine functioning. And we do exercises with the students during the workshop. And then we do a mindfulness workshop where we discuss ways of uh, developing a mindfulness practice or a guided relaxation practice. And again, we practice several approaches in the workshop and um, look at possible apps for supporting a mindfulness practice. So these are very practical workshops. There is a little bit of uh, instruction and theory, but mostly it's about getting students to engage with the techniques. So in terms of research, we've done three structured pieces of research and we're currently doing another one. But the ones that, we've, that we have done are a randomized control trial with psychology first year students, which lasted a month. A single group control, a single group trial with nursing first year students uh, lasting a month on looking at the relationship between engagement with the intervention in terms of how much they actually practice the techniques over the month and the eventual outcome. And then a larger study based on students across a variety of degree programs within the Faculty of Education and Health at the University of Greenwich. We had 145 students in that, principally qualitative data that we got out of that. Uh, study, small amounts of data per person. And the findings from those studies were as follows, just the headlines. The first study, we found the experimental group significantly decreased in perceived stress and neuroticism relative to the control group. Obviously, we only know that over a period of a month, but it was promising. In study two, in the within group design, engagement with the intervention was correlated at minus 0.41 with changes in perceived stress from pre-intervention to post-intervention. In other words, uh, a really robust correlation between doing the techniques more and experiencing less stress. And then finally, in study three, 69% of the sample, uh, so 100 out of 145 participants provided positive qualitative reflections about the intervention workshop. That's not to say that the remaining 31% uh, gave negative reflections, it was just they didn't provide the reflections. We got, we got a few constructive suggestions, but very little that, that had any negative tone. Um, here's an example of one of the positive ones. I feel this experience had a positive effect on me as a student teacher. The reason being is that it related strongly to life at the present. This allowed the workshop to have a very positive and relatable experience, which made it more interesting and beneficial. Examples include the use of the breathing technique to allow me some time to gather my short thoughts and ensure that I remain calm at all times during teaching. Additionally, using assertive language to remain professional throughout discussions and ensure that respect and professionalism are maintained to a high standard at all times. And this was a teacher training student. Now, in all three studies, we also asked for the personal significance of the uh, in terms with some simple quantitative items. Now, this is important because finding statistical significance for an intervention doesn't prove that the intervention is experienced by the participants as beneficial. That is more about personal significance. So we asked the students in study one, um, did they feel there'd be a positive learning experience? and Did they feel that it had been constructive to their development as a person? And you can see that 94% reported it to be a positive learning experience and 80% reported that it was, had been, it was beneficial to their personal development. And we found similar figures in study two, using the same items, 83% reporting that it being a positive learning experience and 90% agreeing that it's, it is and will continue to affect their development positively. And in study three, 87.5, uh, positive learning experiments, 85% saying it's positively helping their development. So very robust levels of personal significance. Now, in terms of this, the link that students are stating in terms of 
resilience and development. Although resilience is not a construct that is necessarily widely discussed in adult development literature, I just wanted to make some links between it and the, the elements that we look at within the research and, uh, and the intervention and some more established or more widely discussed adult development construct, construct. So we've got resilience in the middle. Positive reframing is one of the elements we look at, undoubtedly links to the issues of meta-awareness and self-awareness. For example, as discussed by Thomas Jordan uh, in adult development theory, um, uh, as integral to the capacity to develop uh, a, 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 a capacity to observe thoughts rather than just think them. And Robert Keegan also discusses that ability is integral uh, to development, capacity to take things which are previously just part of being a subject as, as an object. And I think that positive reframing is, in, we certainly find in our feedback that students describe that process. Positive reframing, I think, also contributes to wisdom because it allows people to see alternative perspectives, and that is a widely recognized feature of wisdom, as well as effective help seeking also being about the humility that wisdom uh, is uh, is uh, about. And when I say that, I mean, um, if you're seeking help, you have to express vulnerability and it's a, it's a humbling experience, albeit a courageous one. Assertiveness and goal setting certainly, in my opinion, relate to self-authorship. Both uh, are fundamental to developing a sense of personal control and agency and also to understanding the limits of those things as well. Um, and to integration, um, goal setting and developing uh, a, an integration of one's goals are integral to having some kind of integrative approach to adult life. And finally, mindfulness and breathing techniques remind me of uh, equanimity as a stated goal for development, which was mentioned by George Valent in his prolific work on adult development as an important feature of adult life, developing a past capacity to uh, remain calm and to avoid the ups and the, 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 the drastic ups and downs that adult life can bring by softening those the ups and downs and creating a more even uh, experience of adult life. And I have to say, I think that th that equanimity is also supported by positive reframing and other features on the on the intervention as well as the mindfulness and breathing techniques. They just help to create a little bit of a distance between the agent, uh, as it were, this is the observing self and the emotions. So thanks for listening. Much of what I've discussed is available in the journal article that you see on the top of the screen. It's currently in press. It's available on ResearchGate uh, or feel free to drop me an email. My email that is on the screen if you'd like a copy. Um, and here are some references and relevant reading for you to have a look at if you're interested in this area.